Okay, so we will start the recording of this session. And uh, meanwhile, if you have any question, please let me know. I know we have quite a few things to do in this uh, next two weeks. So I'm gonna basically talk briefly about each and every one of the things that we need to cover. Meanwhile, I urge everyone, if you guys have any questions, please do so as soon as possible because we don't want things to be left to the last minute and then we'll start, about, ta start talking about them. So let me go back and share the screen onto where I was. Okay, let me first of all uh, go to a tab that is, uh, okay. Again, okay. So this is basically from my uh, perspective, looking at the course to see where we stand in general. There are, we're covered most of the stuff that we're supposed to be covering. We are in week five leading to week uh, six actually. And those are the last three chapters basically, actually the last two chapters to be more specific, the last chapter, the chapter before that, we covered half of it before. So we're almost done with the content of this class. We still have quite a few assignments that are still due. So we will, uh, let me go to uh, the models because this is a better basically, uh, more finite basically uh, look at it. So we're looking at week five right now. Uh, we're talking about Venus and Mars. We're talking about the giant planets. And we finally are talking about the rings, moons, and uh, Pluto. We're uh, dedicating a special section for Pluto because of its importance, okay? So we can remove the camera if you don't, okay, good, very good because we want to save a little bit of bandwidth. And again, if you have questions, please do ask, okay? Uh, before I do that, before I talk about that, there is a very, very important thing that is coming tomorrow, that is due by the, uh, by the end of tomorrow. And that is basically the uh, assignment. What am I looking at in here? There is an assignment that is due tomorrow that was actually started from uh, week four. And that is the Stellarium and Celestial Sphere. That is a project that is due tomorrow. And I want everybody to make sure that they are uh, almost done by it today. Hopefully uh, you did not have any difficulty. If you did, please let me know as uh, late as today so that we can work out whatever details is, are. Now, if uh, you guys are having difficulty with the software or something, please let me know too. I may even give you access to my computer so that you can do the actual simulation to it and run whatever you need to do. The bottom line is, you should be able to do this. As a matter of fact, I believe even on their website, stellarium.org, they think that probably they can give you even access to, uh, to doing what you need to do. So the bottom line is this project is due tomorrow. Actually, this assignment is due tomorrow. And I want everybody to be uh, thinking about completing this one because it has a, a high point value and it's, it's, a, it's a homework assignment, actually. It's not a quiz to be balanced by other quizzes. And the homeworks are at this point far and few in between. So uh, there is more to come. But the bottom line is this needs to be done, hopefully, to make sure that you get, uh, gather as much points as, as, as you can. I know I went through this last time when I talked about this one. A lot of this are uh, basically very, very check, very easy to earn those points because you check the mark that you did, you did, you did, you did, and hopefully I trust you did because later on you're going to be collecting data. So if you didn't check those marks, of course, you're not, I mean, if you didn't do actually those that you checked, you did, you're not going to be able to collect the data. So in a sense, a lot of these points are very easy to be earned. All you have to do is just make sure you do what you're supposed to do, basically um, change the orientation, change the location, change the time, uh, make sure that you're uh, looking at south, north, finding objects in the sky, and once you do, you're just going to check those marks. Then we get into the nitty gritty part of it where we start asking questions about, for example, finding when the sun sets, when the sun rises, when Arcturus rises, or one of those things that we're tracking them on specific dates. Then at that point, you're going to change the date again and the time and actually the location to the place we're supposed to be. And once you do that, you should be able to read the numbers as you're asked to be reading them and input them, that's all. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are places where you're gonna be filling tables that is going to be a lot of points in there. So you want to make sure all of the data is entered in there correctly to earn those tables. So those where the big points are going to be. I mean, it's actually still individually, individual pieces. 
So I hope that everybody is almost done with it because once if you start late, you will discover that you have a lot of things to do. So I always ask and urge people to really start as soon as possible, as soon as the assignment is given. This was from last week. So I was hoping that by today, actually you're done. I know that there is only a few people who so far submitted their assignment. So I'm kind of worried. That's why I'm really encouraging everybody to finish it as soon as possible to submit it on time before tomorrow. So this is one thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of... Uh, of the stuff that is due and again this is from week four and it's due tomorrow to the, i'm sorry do the 24th did i say tomorrow yeah it's still uh, the 24th july 24th and today is the 21st so we still have a little bit of time but it's still there's a lot of things to be done in this assignment so i want everybody to make sure that they are ready and done by it hopefully not on the 24th hopefully by tomorrow or the day after Today, the 21st, we still have Wednesday, the 22nd, Thursday, the 23rd. So this is apparently due by Friday. So I'm hoping that everybody will be submitting it no, not, uh, uh, not too late, okay? So that's one thing. Uh, we have quite a few other assignments that, are, that were due last Saturday. So I hope that uh, all of you guys have finished them. We still have more assignments due this week and that is part of a homework assignment also, which is another thing that is, like I said, another homework assignment. There is a quiz in between them. So there is quite a few things that are due this, this week. There is a discussion participation uh, type uh, assignment that is also due this, this week. So we have quite a few things this week. Next week, we have a quiz. And we have the final review, which is also participation quiz. So there will be no discussion for next week, as you know, have, probably have noticed already, because even this week and next week, they are already open. They're available already on Canvas. So there is nothing that is not available on Canvas with the exception of the final. The final is going to be open on the 30th, July 30th. Uh, I'm sorry, it's going to be due July 30th, but it's going to be available July uh, 29th at 8 o'clock in the morning. You will have a little over 24 hours to complete the final. So the final is a little bit different than all of the other assignments in a sense there is less time for it. So I hope, first of all, that everyone takes advantage of the review because that's a point of participation. Again, so you need to do the review, just go through it, submit it, it doesn't matter if you get all of them wrong or all of them right. The point being in here is that you go through the review to prepare yourself for the final. There are probably more than 200 and some odd questions in there that you need to go through. Make sure you understand those ones. Make sure you know the answers to these things. Make sure you go and consult the book about them. You ask me if you still have if you're still not sure about the answers or something so that we have clarifications on everything. And then you come the final time Everything closes before the final. Nothing is going to be due before the 29th, so that you guys know. So at that point, the only focus that you have is the final. During that time, I should have had all of your assignments basically collected from you. And uh, I know that I have graded, I think, all of them so far. And uh, if there is anything that is due from now until the 29th, the latest is going to be graded is on the 29th. So you should have your final grade by the 29th without the final. Now, if you take the final, the final is automatically graded. So you're going to see the total on your on canvas. That total is going to be the letter grade uh, that is going to be submitted actually on the 9th of the 30th to the system, to the uh, registrar. It is very important that you pay attention to this thing. So hopefully you catch any mistake before it goes uh, on the system. I'll try to make a wiggle room in there so that if you guys have uh, any questions or concerns or something that was not graded correctly or something that was not added right or something like that or an assignment that you thought it has uh, been emailed and I did not credit you for it or something, it needs to be addressed hopefully before that so that we catch it because once it goes into the registrar, it's very hard for me. It's not really impossible. It's, 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 there is some paperwork that needs to be done basically for me to go through in order to change the grade. So I'm hoping that everybody will be very keen and basically observant to that, paying attention to what's going on. They know before taking the final where they stand in terms of their grade. And they know also 
what needs to be done once they take the final they know where they stand and now if there is doubt about it one way or the other they should shoot me an email immediately or if i don't respond within minutes they can text me also if i'm driving or something i will do everything i can so that i won't be away from my computer at that time so that you guys know on the 30th on the on the 29th and the 30th that's basically what my focus is to make sure that your uh, your your grades are all in the system and they're correct and there is no mistake about it okay so this is in a nutshell in terms of assignments in terms of grades in terms of stuff where we stand on now there is a very important thing that is for me not for anybody else actually and that is the survey there is a survey that is due next week. Actually, it's not an assignment at all. As the word says in there, it's optional. So you will not receive a grade for it. You will not receive a, uh, you will not be basically rewarded for doing it. You will not be penalized for not doing it. It's actually to help me uh, uh, improve basically uh, my delivery. It's not even, I mean, it's in a sense, it benefits the school too, in a sense that it's going to uh, uh, give them basically uh, better tools in a sense how to, to, to do this course, especially since we're doing them purely online. So this is a survey that is not going to track your name, that is not going to track your email address, that is not going to track your login name, that is not going to track your IP address, that is not going to track your, your, your time or anything like that. So basically, it's a completely anonymous survey and you're probably asking since it's on Canvas, maybe uh, they already know since I'm logged in on Canvas. Let me reassure you that this is actually not from Canvas. This is actually an external survey. So if you're a little bit familiar with HTML or browsers in general, you can right click on anything. I'm using Firefox. You can try it with anything, even with Chrome or Edge. Or I'm not 100% sure about uh, uh, but I'm sure it exists too on, uh, what is that, the Mac software, Safari. But uh, Safari, I don't think it works well with, the, with, the, with a lot of the things we're doing anyway. So if you're not using Chrome or Firefox or even Edge, probably or you may have difficulty looking at these things. So I'm on uh, Firefox right now, so I'm going to go and inspect an element to, just to show you that this is actually not on Canvas to make sure that you guys can fill whatever you think is appropriate in terms of please keep it uh, basically practical and uh, constructive so that we can really benefit from uh, your input. You are the expert in learning. I mean, I may be expert in other areas, but you're the best in terms of what needs to be done for you to learn. So that's why I'm relying on your input in here. So I, I inspected this element in here. When I hover on any of these things in here, this is the HTML markup basically behind the, the browser. So it gives you where you are in terms of the browser. So right now I'm looking at, the, uh, at that form, actually the body of the form. So if I go uh, up to it, that's actually an HTML to it. Here is what I want you to pay attention to. This is the entire box. It's an iframe. You may Google what an iframe me means in terms of an HTML, and it means that it's linking something external and bringing it into, into, uh, into something in here. So it's not really a, on Canvas, it's sitting somewhere else. Where is it sitting? It's sitting on Google Docs. That's actually a spreadsheet that I have created myself. And uh, so in other words, Canvas has no uh, uh, awareness or knowledge of what this form is doing. So you can put whatever you want to put in there and everything is going to be fed directly into, into, uh, into, uh, into uh, the Google Docs, the file that I have there, the spreadsheet that is collecting the data in there. Now, if you don't like this, what you can do, and actually I can send you the link to if you want to, you can right click on this one in here, edit HTML and come and copy just the link, this one. So I'm gonna copy it. I'm going to right click and say copy. I'm going to open a new tab in here. I'm going to paste it in my browser. And it's taking me to the same form, but not on Canvas. It's taking me to the same form on Google. So now you are on Google, actually. You can fill out this form, hopefully. It has three sections, as you can see from the bottom. Some of the fields are required fields and some of the fields are not. So when you see a star next to them, those you need to put yes or no, or whatever you want to feel you need to do, but it needs to be filled. This one, for example, is not. And then you continue until you're done with it and submit it. 
Again, I'm not collecting your personal information. It's just for m my use. Hopefully this clarifies this point in here because I want to make sure that uh, hopefully as many people as possible can, uh, can, uh, can fill this form for me and uh, to help me basically make this course better. Okay, so make, uh, think about it as a service for your uh, classmates who are coming after you guys in this school or elsewhere. So that's one of the things that I wanted everybody to be aware of. And uh, that sits really in the bottom of, uh, it's not required. It's not, if you don't do it, it's gonna be, uh, you're fine. You can go to the final, it's fine. But if you do it, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's gonna be very helpful for me. It has no, no rewards or uh, penalties for it. So that's in terms of assignments, in terms of everything that is coming, in terms of all of the things that is. So this is basically the administrative tab. In terms of content now, in terms of content, again, uh, we have the chapter on Venus and Mars. Venus and Mars are, uh, I'm hoping that you guys are, are, are going through the entire content in here. These are just notes. So you're supposed to go through the details in there in order for you to be able to pass those quizzes. And I'm sure a lot of you are passing them with almost perfect scores. Some of you are uh, very close from also from that too. So I'm sure that you're doing actually the reviews too. So you're not just looking at these notes and thinking that this is it. So again, this is Mars and uh, Venus. Mars is heavily uh, 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 explored, basically. We, went, uh, land, we sent landers to it. As a matter of fact, last week, or this week, actually, we sent a new, uh, a new probe to Mars called uh, HOPE. Actually, uh, it's, not, it's an orbiter. And HOPE is supposed to be uh, mapping the, uh, the details of, uh, of the weather, basically, uh, on Mars for at least two years and the mission can be extended. This is a project mainly by the UAE, United Arab Emirates, and it's actually in collaboration with the Japanese. The Japanese are actually going to launch, they launched already HOPE, and it's on its way already. Six months from now, it's going to be orbiting uh, Mars, and it's going to give us basically more information on its weather. There is another mission by uh, the Chinese actually, and it's very little said about this one, and actually it's going to also go this week or next week too. The reason why is because the window for, for sending stuff to Mars is, uh, uh, opens only, only after two and a half, two, two years and four months. So right now is, we are in that window. That's why there are three missions actually going to Mars right now. So there are three missions going one after the other going to Mars. Uh, the, the Chinese, the only thing we know about the Chinese mission is that they have an orbiter and a lander. And they didn't say a lot of details about it. Uh, most of the Chinese, most of the projects of the Chinese, they do that all the time anyway. What we know about the lander is that it's supposed to use all kinds of technologies uh, 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 to land safely on, on, uh, on Mars. This is their first attempt at it. So we're not sure if it's going to be successful, or it's going to be a problem. I mean, especially with what's going on right now with the, uh, with the COVID and the fact that they are blamed for most of what happened to the world because of it, that they did not warn the world about it. So if it does not succeed, I think it's going to be a problem for the Chinese. So that's, that's one thing. And there is also another, a NASA project also involved in that. So there is also another one from the United States sending uh, their mission to Mars. So this is a heavily explored planet by, the, uh, by uh, humans. And uh, some people believe that this is an alternative or an option for us as humans to, uh, to go to. And I'm not sure about that, honestly. I think in terms of scientific exploration, it's, it's really a, uh, it's, 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 we can learn a lot about the solar system and about Mars itself, about the planets, about Earth itself, just by doing this really kind of work on, on Mars. It may be actually in terms of resources also as an option if we were able to find some sort of useful resources for our technologies. But in terms of uh, uh, habitability, at this point, I don't know. There is all kinds of problems with Mars. For example, the atmosphere there is very, very thin and it has very little uh, uh, oxygen. One of the pro things that I believe the Chinese are trying to do is some sort of a uh, 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 break down the, uh, the carbon dioxide there on, on the planet and see if they can make oxygen out of it. So there is some, some terraforming projects or thinking at least along these lines. 
Elon Musk is excited about these things and he's working very hard trying to do something about basically making Mars into a habitable planet. But there is actually not just the atmosphere that is a problem. The, the atmospheric pressure is very, very low on that planet. That's another problem. And the other problem, of course, it does not have a magnetic field which makes the radiation and it has a very thin atmosphere which makes any uh, solar uh, radiation or uh, actually cosmic radiation to be very, very harmful and detrimental to any kind of uh, carbon-based life form that we know of. So uh, the planet is, uh, has a lot of features actually that are unique in the solar system. It has uh, the largest volcano basically in terms of uh, Olympus Mount and it has actually uh, the biggest uh, canyons in the, uh, in the solar system. So it has a lot of unique features. On the other extreme or the other end of the spectrum, I mean, in terms of its history, of course, it had water. We know that there is all kinds of uh, evidence for that. And as a matter of fact, there is uh, currently still uh, potentially, I think there is a, what is the, uh, yeah, evidence for, for water, uh, uh, basically uh, ice water in this case in here that was digged by uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Phoenix lander. So that's basically some of the uh, things that are unique to this planet. So this is has a lot of evidence for uh, for uh, for uh, for, uh, for, uh, for for water in its past. Venus, on the other hand, is actually uh, uh, worse than Mars in terms of habitability. It's super super hot atmosphere. Uh, I mean, on the surface, as a matter of fact, it's uh, it's um, probably the hottest planet in the solar system. It is not probably, it is the hottest planet in, in, in the solar system. It's even hotter than, uh, than uh, uh, Mercury. And the reason being is not because it's closer to the sun, but it's because of its super, super thick atmosphere. The atmospheric pressure on the planet's surface is about 90 atmospheric pressure than in here. Imagine yourself, I mean, going, if you go 10 meters below the surface of the water, you're going to be experiencing twice the atmospheric pressure. You're going to be basically feeling that you're going to be to implode. Your, 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 your outside is going to go inside. But if you go 20 meters, it's twice the atmospheric pre pressure. If you go 100 meters, you're going to be crushed by the, the water that is from everywhere coming to you. Without protective suit, you're not going to be able to survive that. So the atmospheric pressure itself, I mean, will 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 uh, will uh, will play will not be uh, helpful at all for any kind of. But that's not the only problem. The carbon dioxide, the toxic, basically, uh, 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 atmosphere. In addition to the fact that it drains acid on the planet, it drains sulfuric acid on the planet. So there is no way that there is life, at least on the surface. So this is the image that uh, uh, the, the lander actually, uh, what is it, for the mariner? No, I'm sorry, that's the uh, Venera, the, the, uh, the Soviet basically uh, uh, lander that landed in there for a few minutes. It took pictures of the surface and the surface is really, really hot and it's a hazy atmosphere. I mean, even in the best days, you cannot see the sun as we see it on Earth in here. So uh, now there is a potential for life on its probably atmosphere, but that's another thing that is probably expo explored and it's really not explored on a large scale. So Venus itself is, is, is a problem for that, uh, I mean, as it is. Now you ask, was Venus all the, ti all the time like this one? Up to 150 million years ago, and that is very, very recent in terms of geology, in terms of geologic times, uh, the planet was actually, uh, had oceans. And it did not look much different than the Earth. Its temperature overall was slightly higher than that of the Earth on average, but it did not look much different than what the Earth looked like. For some reason, and at this point, it's being explored. This was part of a paper that came out in, I think, uh, in the early this year, is that uh, some sort of uh, 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 chain, uh, basically, volcanic activity started on the planet. It could have very well be triggered by some sort of an impact from, from a meteor or something like that that hit the planet. And when it hit it, the volcano started and did not stop emitting all of the carbon dioxide, heating the atmosphere of the planet, boiling the, the, the oceans that were on the planet, 
And not only that, taking the H2O, the water and the, that, uh, the, that was uh, basically that evaporated and breaking it down into oxygen and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, hydrogen. The hydrogen being lighter rose above the atmosphere and was lost. And the oxygen that was there mixed with the carbon dioxide and made the planet into a carbon and made carbon dioxide and all kinds of carbonic carbon oxides. And in doing so, the planet became hellish, devoured almost of all of the hydrogen that it had before. So there is no way now we can recover all of the water that was in there because it's basically broke down and part of it has escaped forever. And that the planet became the hellish place that it is right now. Is it possible that the Earth can go through the same process? It is. So we're not far-fetched from that scenario. It could be triggered by external processes. Fortunately for the carbon dioxide on the Earth, it's mainly in the rock. And that's how it was exactly also with the case of Venus. But if somehow it's released, the process could be repeated again on Earth. So Earth is not safe. So if we're not careful with this planet, it's going to undergo similar processes, or it could be man-made. And that's exactly probably where we're headed to at this point. So we have to be very careful with the delicate balance in terms of here of this planet, or else we're gonna end up something similar to what happened to Mars, I mean to Venus. So that's in a nutshell, basically what this, two, uh, chap what this chapter is talking about. Of course, it has all of the craters in here. If you look at the surface of, uh, of um, Mars, for example, it's heavily cratered compared to the surface of, of uh, Venus. Venus has a lot of weathering. I mean, you have to have a very big, basically, uh, a meteor to create those craters. Otherwise, it does not penetrate. It's going to basically be blown away in the atmosphere. So those are some of the things that we know about the, uh, about, uh, the geology of the two planets in terms of their properties, physical properties. They're listed in this table. Overall, the density, as we said, of the Earth is the highest in the solar system. Venus is not far-fetched. Actually, Venus is the twin sister to the Earth in almost every single respect. The, the mass of the Earth, the mass of Venus is 82% that of the mass of the Earth. The uh, year, of course, is being closer, is shorter. The period, of course, that's uh, uh, the semi-major axis because it's closer. It's 72% closer to the sun than what the Earth is. Uh, in terms of the surface gravity, it's 91% the surface of the Earth. So if you were to stand, and you can't, on the surface of Venus because of the atmospheric pressure that is going to crush you, if you can stand in there, you'll feel almost your weight. So if you weigh 100 pounds on planet Earth, you're going to weigh 91 pounds on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on Venus. But you will weigh 38 pounds on, <laughs> on, on Mars. That's why Matt Damon in that movie, what is it, The Martian?, uh, he did not really need a lot of fuel to escape planet, uh, planet uh, uh, Mars, but he had he been on, on uh, planet uh, Venus, he would need far more, more than twice the uh, fuel. Look at the escape velocity. The escape velocity on Earth being more massive than the other two and has more diameter than the other two, it's 11.2 kilometers per second. Whereas on Mars, whereas on Venus, it's 10.4 kilometers per second. It's not far. It's not too, differ too different from it. Uh, the escape velocity on Mars is about 5 kilometers per second, so it does not require a lot of fuel to escape. It's, 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 uh, it's a gravitational pull, basically. This is one of the, actually, the studies that we're conducting right now on exoplanets and see exactly, uh, will, we, will we be able to communicate with civilizations in, outside of the uh, of the uh, the solar system, basically, if we were to able to. Now, this escape velocity actually is a critical value too, because if the planet is twice as big in terms of the mass than Earth is, it will make it almost impossible for any technology on there to escape their, their pole. So they will not be able to send probes to ex explore their own, uh, basically, stellar system and see what's going on out there or do anything. The only thing they probably could do is just send the signal and that's it. So this thing in here is critical thing in here for us because they will need a lot of energy. That's probably going to equate to basically burning probably a quarter of the planet just to, to escape the pole in one experiment, which is impossible to do. So that's one of the things that you need to look forward when you're looking and reading about, uh, about uh, uh, exoplanets. Uh, in terms of the day on those planets, 
Look at the day on Earth, it's almost 24 hours. On Mars, it's slightly over 24 hours. So if you watch that movie or any sci-fi movies, they talk about so, uh, uh, how many soul days they call them, basically. It's almost the same day, so 24 hours. Whereas on, on Venus, it's 243 days. 243 days will put it more than 0.61. So it takes longer for Venus to spin around its axis than to go around the sun. So it's very, very, very slowly spinning. That's why it does not, I mean, although it has a molten uh, basically core as the Earth does, but it does not have a magnetic field as the Earth does because it's very, very slow rotation. So it's really not a, uh, not a good uh, 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 in the sense that there is no way that it should have a magnetic field at least similar to that of the Earth. In terms of, uh, again, here is the atmospheric pressure I was talking about. The atmospheric pressure on Mars is very, very small. So if you were to implode on Venus, because of the atmospheric pressure that is coming to you through you from everywhere, you're going to explode in the case of Mars because there is lack of atmospheric pressure. So if you were not protected, you're going, uh, you're, you're going to basically, uh, your blood and everything starts to come up. So again, so this is some of the things that are, uh, I mean, this is the ideal place. Let's save it for ourselves and let's protect it. Okay, it doesn't matter which side of the political aisle you are, you really have to look at it from a scientific perspective. And it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's the most valuable thing that we have inherited and we have to save it. Okay, so this is in a nutshell the two chapters that I, uh, I mean this chapter. So let me talk a little bit about the other chapters unless you guys have any question about this. Then we have the giant planets. That's the other part in here that is uh, the, we'll talk about in this uh, week, actually. And the giant planets are four of them again. And they're in, uh, uh, in, the, in, uh, in terms of their distance from the sun. You have Jupiter, you have uh, Saturn, you have Uranus, and you have Neptune. Okay, so those are the planets that are in the... Uh, Again, we talked about this last time when we did an overview of the solar system. There is a frost line which is just outside of the, uh, of the uh, asteroid belt that separates the inner planets from the outer planets where the water becomes frozen, basically, and uh, can exist only in frozen form because of the low temperatures. And those are the planets there and there. In terms of size, of course, both mass and, and radius, uh, there is nothing that can compare to, uh, to uh, Jupiter in the solar system. Jupiter, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's just below what it needs to be for it to be a star. Uh, the thing with it is, it must have formed early, just after the sun started to have formed, when the sun started to, the, the gas, namely the hydrogen mainly, and the uh, helium starts to coalesce in itself and form the, uh, the sun. Uh, that's a, a little bit after that when uh, Venus, I mean uh, Jupiter, starts to form, and that's why it fed early. It was uh, started early and it fed more, so its size grew big. Had the sun not gone nuclear and basically expelled all of the gas that was surrounding these planets, probably uh, Jupiter could have gone, continued basically uh, feeding and growing in size, and maybe itself it could have gone nuclear. It could have gone into another star. So right now, it's a kind of a failed star in a sense. And if it had grown a little bit, at least it would have been another star, not of the same classification as the sun. It would have been probably a red uh, dwarf star, but it would have been a star nonetheless. At this point, there is no nuclear reactions that are existing in, this, in the Jupiter to be considered a star. So it is a planet, but uh, it's mainly still hydrogen but there is a little bit of helium. But when you go in the, other, uh, the upper atmosphere, you will find, of course, the ammonia and the, uh, the, all of the basically hydrogen compounds that are in there, that exist in there. Uh, in terms of, uh, so it's a gas giant. In terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Saturn, it's almost similar in structure than, the, uh, than, than Jupiter. The only thing with it is that it did not grow as big. And thank God it did not, because if it did, if it was the same size of Jupiter, uh, uh, it could, they could have, because of their combined weight, they could have caused 
uh, uh, wreaked havoc actually on the solar system and probably would not have allowed any of the other planets to coexist with them. And either they would have basically thrown them out of the solar system or pushed them toward the sun. And uh, in the beginning of the solar system, there were probably most likely there were more uh, planets than what uh, we count right now, namely eight planets. And that's exactly the fate of most of the planets that had uh, existed before in the solar system. One of them is a Mars-sized planet, probably the same size as Mars. And now we have, gave it a name, Thea, was thrown inward toward the solar system. And in doing so, it collided with Earth to a certain angle and that collision, first of all, created the tilt of the Earth that we know right now, causing basically the seasons and uh, all of the wonderful things that we know about this, uh, the Earth. And actually also in the same time created the moon. So the moon is an odd thing for us on Earth. <clears throat> and the explanation for it right now, the only scientific explanation that can fit all of what's going on in terms of structure of the moon, structure of the Earth, the, the tilt, all of the, the odd the odd fact that the moon exists around the earth is this explanation right now, this which is called the uh, giant uh, collision or the um, hypothesis basically. And that could have been, I mean, it could have very well been explained by the fact that uh, Saturn is big, but not too big. Had it been any bigger, even the earth would not stay in its orbit or uh, 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 Mars or any of the other planets or even the other ones. So, so this is one of the things that is good in the solar system. Again, it's a big giant. It's the second one in mass and also in, in, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, composition, in terms of radius. Then you have the other two blue uh, planets. Those are really frozen, solid universe, uh, planets. They are really mainly, I mean, they're, they have gas in the atmosphere, of course. They have actually super fast wind in their, in their planets. Uh, one of them is actually greenish to uh, low yellow, uh, blue color, I'm sorry. And that is actually uh, uh, Uranus and because of its composition. Whereas the other one is a dark blue uh, pla planet. Historically, I mean, with the naked eye, we cannot see this too. Probably we could, but to this one, because it's far away, we could have identified it as just another star because it's moving very slow in the sky. But it was Herschel in the 1800s who by accident discovered it, okay? So now we know that there is another planet Uranus out there. So that's how we knew about it. Two astronomers, John Adams on one side and Leverrier on the other side, basically uh, mathematicians actually just looking at the data in terms of period and the, the position of Uranus. They discovered that there is a problem. There is a 5% uh, 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 percent error between the observation and the theory. And that problem could only be explained they thought, and they were thinking independently, unaware of each other, completely separate from one another, one in England and the other one in France. And uh, they came up with a conclusion independently that there must be another planet that exists in a specific location in the, in the, in the sky. And uh, one of them uh, published his work in 1845 and the other one in 1846. And they agreed within a degree that the planet must exist in the specific point, which prompted the, uh, the British uh, Astronomical Society basically to point their telescopes in there. And sure enough, that's how Neptune was found. So this is a triumph for uh, Newton's work on, on, on mechanics, because here you have a model that Mr. Newton has built for the solar system, for gravity in general and math behind it. And basically then the, you put all of these things together and you say, okay, Uranus should be moving with this speed, not with what I am looking at. If you're telling me this is what it's, uh, what it's moving with, then I have to add, I mean, now, first of all, I want to, uh, to allow for corrections. You might say, well, if you're calculating it based on just how it is versus the sun, there is a big player in between, namely Jupiter. Can you take Jupiter into account? Okay, I'm gonna include Jupiter into account because Jupiter is a big planet. It still does not account for a difference. You say, okay, there is another player, which is uh, uh, Saturn. I will tell you Jupiter and its might, and it did not account for much of correction. Saturn would not, but let me take that into account. 
And Saturn actually brought up a very, very minute correction compared to what happened before. So the only explanation for it, they independently basically argued, is that there must be another planet of this specific size, of this specific location. Look for it. Sure enough, you go and direct your, your telescopes and you find Neptune. So that was a big triumph, like I said, and it's really a major, major uh, uh, argument for the theory of Newton. And uh, obviously, that prompted a lot of imaginations out there. One of them actually was, let me, uh, let me continue this, this point in here because it's important in the discovery of Pluto. Uh, 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 Percival Lowell, who later on basically was convinced that there was a problem with Neptune's actually a path too. That Neptune's, there is an error in Neptune's uh, orbit that it can only be accounted for by another planet. It was called at that time planet X. And we have to find it. And there was a big, basically, a rush trying to find this planet. Of course, uh, after he died, actually, in the 1930s, when Pluto was discovered, it did not fit the bill in a lot of respects. First of all, in its size. It's not because the calculation predicted that it should be several times the mass of the uh, Earth. Pluto is a lot less than that. Actually, it's less than the moon in terms of mass and size. So, uh, of course, there was a problem, actually, the, the observation, or at least the interpretation of the data that was collected was the problem. Here is another thing. We were prompted by a wrong interpretation of data, looking for something, trying to find it, and we found something else completely unrelated because we made a mistake in the observation and in interpreting the data that we have for the case of, uh, of Neptune. So that's something that is, uh, the discoverer was Clyde Limbaugh, basically uh, uh, Limbaugh, I think his name. He, uh, he named Pluto in honor of actually the first two uh, letters of his name and basically named it Pluto. Charon was discovered in 1978, actually, by James Christ. And uh, when he discovered it, actually, he tried to name it after his wife. And it turns out Charon, actually, that's how his wife's name was, was related in the mythology to, to Pluto because he was afraid that probably the astronomical society would not accept the name because it has to be a name that is following the uh, naming schema that they had. And it fit the bill perfectly, which is in mythology, Charon is some sort of a, uh, it, ha it has to do with the uh, basically um, uh, helping the soul transition into the life after and things like that. Anyway, so this is some of the history that is out there. But the point in here that I want you to take from this one also in terms of how Neptune was discovered and how the math was so critical in making that happen. And although we were uh, basically initially at least uh, um, uh, led by similar argument for the discovery of Pluto, that argument was based on wrong interpretation of data. But again, we discovered another planet, or we, at least we thought it was a planet until later on when we demoted uh, Pluto. So in terms of uh, structures, again, these are the two uh, uh, planets basically and how they are make I mean the outer planets it's mainly hydrogen and helium and the rest are the methane and ammonia that are very small in terms of composition of course water too okay uh, these are the uh, explorations the 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 we don't have a lander specifically on any of these big giants but we had a lander actually on, on one of the moons, the only moon that we had the lander, the only object we landed outside of the uh, inner planets is actually uh, Titan, and that's the moon of Saturn. So if you saw another interesting actually sci-fi movie that came a few years back called Interstellar, that's the moon where they actually go and basically uh, put a human basically a settlement in there. And Titan is interesting because of the fact that it has a similar atmospheric pressure as the Earth does. And it's one of the most exciting things when you look at Saturn, you try to find where Titan is because here is a moon that has oceans like the oceans on Earth or at least lakes like the water surface on the Earth, but it is not water. 
it's ammonia basically because of the low surface temperature but it has a lot of ice still which looks like rocky uh, uh, objects in there because of its atmospheric pressure because it's mainly uh, nitrogen is atmosphere you can basically walk on them that moon with no problem i mean provided you have protection against the low temperatures you should be able to walk on it and taking with you some sort of a device to convert the rocks that are on that moon into breathable uh, oxygen so basically you could be able to survive on it and that's one of the things interesting about it the lander was uh, 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 what is it uh, the uh, the orbiter was cassini around the uh, Saturn. This is actually not. This is uh, Galileo. This is the probe that landed on, uh, on, uh, on Jupiter itself. So that's another thing. That actually, it did not land. I'm sorry, what should I say? It was actually thrown into the atmosphere to collect the data on it and to see how much the composition of the atmosphere. So before it reached the lower ends of the atmosphere, it would have basically, it was disintegrated completely. And this is an artist's rendition of it. So this is not an actual picture. Anyway, one of the things that is odd about this uh, outer planets is actually the orbit or the way that uh, Uranus, I'll try to keep it in there an hour, so I'll try to uh, wrap up things quickly, is uh, Uranus itself has, has this, 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 uh, this feature. All of the planets, remember, they orbit more or less because of conservation of angular momentum on the same plane. So whatever caused the solar system, they basically took up together because of gravity, basically. That's why they came together. So it conserved angular momentum. And that's why they all are almost on the same plane. And they also orbit more or less on the airplane, the same plane, with the exception of some tilt like the Earth, which is 23.5 degrees, which can be explained by the collision with Thea. In the case of uh, Venus, actually, it's backward. So there must have been a collision also that caused it to, uh, to spin backward. And all of the other planets, they're very close from zero degrees or very close from it too. Now, looking at this one, it's backward. It's almost 90 degrees. So again, those two big players, they must have caused some other objects to be basically thrown into, into Uranus to cause it to spin basically on its side like this one. So everybody, think about it, everybody's spinning this way, including Earth, which is slightly tilted. So everybody's uh, spinning this way, including the big the giants, which are slightly tilted again. But, uh, and that's because of their interactions, of course. The case of Venus, backward. The case of this one, it's actually, so when I say backward, it's 180 degrees backward. That's probably what caused it also to slow in its motion too. So it could have been also spinning as fast as everybody else, again, by conservation of angular momentum, but something must have happened to Venus also to cause it to slow down and also flip on its side. Now, in the case of this one, it's actually everybody is spinning this way. This one is doing almost a 90 degree angle and it's spinning on sideways. So there is this, this basically the year there and how much time you're going to be facing. Again, the year is very, very long on Uranus too. So uh, how many times is going to be facing the North Pole is facing the, uh, the, uh, the sun. And then the next six months, once on the other side, it's the South Pole that is facing the sun and how the seasons basically change on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on this planet. So that's one of the things. So in terms of composition, we believe, and again, there is no hard evidence for this one, that because that's how we believe that all of the planets must have started. So they all have rocky in, uh, in, uh, inner parts. But because of the atmospheric pressure that is super high, super high the, the hydrogen exists in a state that is unique, that we don't have in the entire the solar system, at least on planet Earth at all. And that is to be in a metallic liquid form, basically. You need tremendous pressure to, to be able to do that. So that's the case of, uh, of uh, Jupiter. Saturn is not far-fetched. Saturn density on it, I don't know if I have the densities in here. Yes, Saturn density is less than one. That means Saturn itself could float on ocean. So if there is a big enough ocean and you put Saturn on it, it's going to float. Whereas the other, uh, the other uh, basically giants, their density is slightly more than one, which su supports the hypothesis that they are actually mainly gases, but compressed gas. So that's basically their structure. So again, you can tell a lot from the density, basically. And that's why you see mainly for the case of Saturn, it's really this, this kind of gas. So it dominates, that's why its density is less than one. So, uh, so those are in terms of the, the main features, again, you have the, uh, the red, jet, uh, red giant uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, this is not it, but they have a color structure because of the way that the temperature is distributed on their surfaces. And also, of course, there is the, red, uh, uh, the giant red spot on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, I'm sorry, on uh, Jupiter. And there is also another uh, spot that is actually visible also on Neptune too. So those are some of the features in terms of uh, the winds and how fast they are moving also. That's what causes this, this basically uh, hurricane-like basically features on the planets. But because there is no, or at least the surface is very far away, they will last for years and years. For the case of Neptune, it disappeared for, uh, for a few, after a few decades, but it appeared again. So it's really a, a dynamic situation for the case of Jupiter, because it's more massive, it lasts for a long, long time. We've been monitoring this one for at least centuries now, and it did not subside. So this is in terms of the in terms of the giant planets. If we go back to the models because we still have about 10 15 minutes and wrap up this thing quickly. Okay. So again in terms of the moons there probably there is more stories there to be told than just the uh, the uh, the planets and, and examining actually some of the exoplanets and even the rogue planets, planets that don't belong to any star, that are part of the uh, basically wandering planets in the, so in, the, uh, pl in the galaxy, probably their moons will have more uh, uh, conditions, better conditions actually for life than the planets themselves. And uh, in terms of uh, the moons in the solar system, you have basically, these are only few moons. This is the Earth, it has only one moon. Jupiter, I mean, Mars, it has two moons, but they're uh, captured, uh, basically, asteroids. They're not listed in here. In terms of the outer planets, moons, you have them in here. In terms of size, of course, Ganymede is the biggest. Titan is the next. Callisto is the third. And then followed by Io, which has uh, played a major role in terms of the uh, of measurements of the speed of light uh, for on Earth, I mean, for, for the universe and all of that. So it's, it's a major moon in here that uh, orbits uh, Jupiter. And then comes our moon. Europa is uh, big. Then you have Triton, which is the moon of Neptune, which is big. You have Uranus, which is... These are not all the moons, by the way, for Saturn or even Jupiter. You have some 70 moons out there in there for at least Jupiter and the similar, smaller number, but it's almost 60 something for uh, Saturn. So these are not by far all of the moons. Like for example, Charon in here, which is the moon for Pluto, is not the moon. We know that it has four more moons. So for a total of five moons. <coughs> Eris, which is another dwarf planet, actually has also its own moon, this Nomia in here. <coughs> so see, these are some of the, uh, the, the, the moons in terms of their names, in terms of features. Of course, they have a lot of geology. These are listed from closer to further from uh, Jupiter in, from Jupiter in here. Uh, Io itself being very close from Jupiter at some point in its life is going to be on one side because it spins very fast. It goes 42 and a half hours every time, every uh, uh, 42 and a half once around, the, around the Jupiter because it's very close. It has to go that fast to maintain that, or, uh, that uh, orbit. So... At some point, it's on one side. And let's say on that time, you have Europe on one side, you have uh, Ganymede on the other side, and you have Callisto on the other side. They are all pulling it on one side. But it, because it's going to spin and come on the other side, Jupiter will be on one side, and the other three will be on the other side. So it's constantly being pulled this much one way and the other much this way. So it's basically you're taking the, 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 the dough and you're kneading it all the time. So it's being worked on all the time and it's basically it has a lot of volcanic activity on its surface the most active volcanic object in the solar system is io europe on the other hand has a thick uh, thick uh, basically uh, surface uh, which is solid ice and then underneath because of the geysers that appear in it at least we know that it has a surf uh, 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 um, salty ocean underneath and there is a very good chance that uh, life as we know it exists in its surface because of the heat that is coming from its core and the heat is coming for the same reasons as your uh, io has uh, in, uh, heat and that is because of again the tidal basically forces working between io and jupiter on one side and the other two moons on the other side 
as you move further away, you will see less and less geological activity on the surface and you will have more impacts, craters, indicating that there is very little happening on the surface. Look at Callisto, for example. It's heavily cratered, not too different from uh, the moon or, uh, or Mercury. So it's because it's further away, it has very little basically tidal forces in its core. So there is very little geological activity on its surface. So that's basically why it's, it has this, this features on it. Now, this is basically in a nutshell, these are called the Galileo, Galileo system because it was Galileo actually who's the one who discovered them when he looked at them in the early 1600s. Uh, in terms of size, as I mentioned, Ganymede is the biggest, followed by, uh, uh, I'm sorry, followed by Titan, the moon of uh, Saturn. Then you have another moon of, uh, of uh, Jupiter Callisto, followed by Io, followed closely by the Earth's moon, and then followed by Europa. So those are the moons, the biggest moons in terms of size, in terms of masses also. And in terms of density, they are not too far different from, their, from one another, okay? So again, I talked about the surface, the geology, and this is Titan and Triton. Those are two moons, one from uh, uh, Titan is here. And Triton is actually the moon of Neptune. They have very similar uh, uh, look. And this is actually the lander, Huygens, when it landed on, on, uh, on the pictures. They're actually from the lander. It lasted for about an hour and a half on the moon. Now, the discovery of Neptune, it's, uh, Pluto itself, was a major triumph, like I said. This is a picture taken uh, by Clyde Tombaugh over two days. He was actually uh, a farmer interested in astronomy and he was given a job to basically clean the plates where they take pictures on. And he's the one who discovered that before even getting his training in astronomy, he looked at this dot in here in the picture and now it's not there anymore. It's not here anymore. It has moved here. If it were a star, these are stars, you, these are for average, uh, several days, stars don't move. So it must have been a planet. And that's how Pluto was discovered, really. That's how it was discovered, and later on it was uh, documented that. Now, it is initially were thought to be a planet. We have these beautiful pictures from uh, the missions that went by it. This is a, but then it was demoted. The reason why it was demoted, because Eris is out there. Eris is actually another dwarf planet that is similar in size to Pluto and actually more massive than Pluto itself. And later on, we discovered a bunch of more similar objects in, the, in the, uh, what we know now, the Kuiper Belt, basically. So there are more and more dwarf planets that are being discovered on a regular basis. At least uh, some of them are what? We have Maki Maki, we have uh, uh, Sirius, actually another planet in here that is uh, Sedona is another one. This is Sirius is another, not in the Kuiper Belt, but rather it's in the, uh, in the uh, asteroid belt. So there are some of the uh, objects that we have discovered so far, and they are actually uh, reclassified, and there is, uh, the reason for it is because we have too many of them. And uh, the saying in here is that, yes, it's a dwarf planet, but a dwarf planet is still a planet. Because in the case of... Uh, of uh, of uh, uh, the Pluto, for example, it has moons. It has five, uh, five moons altogether. One of them is uh, Charon, which is the ratio moon to planet. It's the biggest ratio in the solar system. Uh, Haumea, for example, it spins so fast on its, uh, on, its, uh, on its axis that it, has, it does not have a spherical object at all. It has actually a, 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 a more of a... Uh, an ellipsoid object, basically, like the egg, okay? So that's how that forms, because it's spinning so fast on its axis. So when it's spinning, the material is trying to escape the planet, but because it still has some gravity, so it's not uh, uh, torn apart. Had it spun a little faster, it would have broken into two pieces or more. So that's basically how this... One of the surprising things about uh, Pluto is that we expected to find more moons for it because of the fact that once 
Pluto was uh, was uh, Sharon was discovered, uh, people thought, okay, there must have been a reason for that moon to exist in there, and it could have been a collision in the past history of the planet. So we expected to find far more debris there and more objects in there, and we only ended up with five. So it was kind of a surprise to to do that. So at this point, there is no explanation for that. We don't know how this planet ended up with that moon, or more moons for that matter. In terms of ring structure, again, these are the tidal forces at work. And uh, all of the outer planets have, uh, have, have rings. Initially, I mean, obviously, rings for Saturn are one of the most uh, basically big features, at least in the solar system. But then all of the others, actually, when you look up close to them, you'll find that they, are more, they have rings. And uh, in the passing of, uh, of uh, Uranus in front of the, one of the stars, that's how we discovered it, actually. Because of the dimming of the light, we discovered it has rings. So this is in a nutshell. Basically, I urge you, again, that you go through the content to go through it. Try to understand it. If you have any questions, please ask me. Because you're supposed to do quizzes. You're supposed to do assignments. You're supposed to be doing homework on this thing. So consult the book. If you have any questions, please do ask me. And uh, we will, I'll try to answer them as soon as I can. And also, uh, don't forget you have assignments that are due this week, a bunch of them, and also some next week. By the 29th, there should not be any more assignment other than the final. Oh, one word I didn't talk about, which is due actually also uh, next week, which is something that we talked about a long, long time ago, namely the, uh, it's actually from week one. No, uh, probably from, sorry, week one is not. Uh, from the Lunar Observation Project. It's due next week too. So you should have finished that by now and hopefully you submitted too. That is actually due also next week. And there is a form for it too that you should have. Uh, you guys don't have the form? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna upload the form. I thought I did. Okay, I'm gonna upload the form. I'm sorry, Rachel. I'm gonna upload the form uh, today, actually. And I'm gonna send a message to everybody if they choose to use it. Again, they can use whatever form they want to, but I'm going to uh, send the form to uh, turn, uh, tonight, put, post it next to the assignment and make an announcement so that everybody ben benefits from it and they can use the form if they choose to. Again, it's not required the form, but if they want to, they can use that too. Okay, if you guys don't have any question, I'm gonna end the session now, but... Uh, and I will post it hopefully by the end of the day. And if you guys, I know that you're here. If you don't see the form by like 5 p.m. or something, please email me, okay, as a reminder. Thank you.